Next up, we have Timur Rajabov. So a 35-year-old super GM from Azerbaijan. He was actually born in Baku, the same city as another very famous chess player, Garry Kasparov. Now he was a child prodigy, Rajabov, an exceptional player, the youngest grandmaster at the time when he became a GM. So really raw talent. He's done amazing things over the years and he won the World Cup in 2019, which qualified him for the Candidates Tournament 2020 but he didn't play in that one. He withdrew during the global pandemic of coronavirus, COVID-19. He pulled out, Maxime Bashir-Lagrave took his place, but then the tournament was paused partway through. He demanded to FIDE that he be reinstated, and what they said to him was, okay, we'll give you a pass into the next candidates tournament. So that's why he's playing in this year's tournament. He got automatically entered because he lost his place in the last one. So he's another one of these dark horses. He's not necessarily been in exceptional form the last couple of years, but we know how dangerous he is, and he shows that in this game. So we're rewinding to the World Cup 2019. This is what he did in the final against Ding Liren, a player over 2,800, classy guy, needs no introduction. Watch this with the white pieces. So e4 from Rajabov, e5 from Ding, Knight f3, and now knight c6 going in for a Roy Lopez, if Raja wants it, which he does with bishop to b5. Pawn a6, the bishop dropped back, now knight to f6, castles from Raja, bishop to e7, all standard stuff so far. The rook comes to the e-file, pawn b5, kicks that bishop back, and now black just castles. And this is the starting position where white has to make a choice. Do you allow black to play the martial attack or martial gambit if they want to, or do you play a so-called anti-martial move? Now we saw Jan Nepomnesi play a lot of h3 and pawn a4, these anti-martial moves against Magnus Carlsen in the recent world championship, but here Raja goes pawn c3. He allows the martial attack with pawn to d5. You don't have to play this as black. You can go pawn d6. That's the classical move. Now, this is a gambit because you take on d5 as white, the knight recaptures, and then you pick up on e5. That pawn was unprotected. Now, why is black doing this? Well, after the rook recaptures, pawn c6, holding this knight in the center, all of these white queenside pieces are undeveloped. Black wants to get these bishops going, dive the queen out here, get a nice initiative against the white king in compensation for the pawn. And now here white wants to move the d-pawn, get some pieces going out rather than take on d5. This is the main way to play. But if you go pawn to d4, this is the old kind of main way to play. Then after black goes bishop to d6, the rook drops back. You can go queen h4, pressuring there on h2. So pawn g3 blocks that attack. Queen h3, and then there's this rook e4 move. And the reason I'm showing this is because it shows why this pawn comes to d3 in the game and not to d4. Because white's now got this threat to come here, trapping in the queen, getting a nice initiative. So g5 is the main response. Looks like you're hanging a pawn to bishop g5 but then there's queen f5, hits two pieces. Now the relevance of all this is that when the pawn's on d3, it's then protecting the rook. This entire line doesn't work for black. So that's why if we come all the way back here, we had pawn to d3 instead of the very natural looking pawn to d4. Now after pawn d3, we did have bishop d6, rook e1, but now instead of going queen to h4, the reason black didn't do that was because of the rook e4 stuff, so bishop f5 played instead. Really subtle stuff in this opening, very theoretical. I'll try not to go too deep, but just to give you a sense of some of the themes. So queen f3 played, hits that bishop, and now queen h4 ignores the attack on the bishop, because basically if you take this one, we're taking here, this should actually be leading to a draw with a rook coming to the e-file, trapping the king from running away. And white wants to go for more than a drawn position. Raja wants to push. So after queen h4, he goes pawn g3. 
We had queen h3 here. And now white could even pick up another pawn by taking on d5, pawn recaptures, queen takes, but then rook d8. Now black's two pawns down, so you really have to know what you're doing in this martial attack. But the compensation here is this huge initiative against the white king. These are still undeveloped. You're likely to win this one back soon, and there could even be a mating attack coming. So white doesn't typically do this. Instead, Radja actually decides to give back material. He goes bishop to e3. So he's left the protection of this pawn on d3. Ding now snaps that one off. Material's back level, but knight d2 now from Radja. So he's managed to develop those queen side pieces. And queen f5 now from Ding. He slides this one back, holds the bishop here, which was a bit loose, offers this queen exchange. So bishop to d4 now from Radja, excellent move. Centralizes that piece. If black takes here, then it brings his knight into the game. So Ding just holds the tension. He goes rook f to d8. You can also bring a rook to the e file there. Many plans, many subtleties. I don't wanna to go too deep on all of this theory here. There's a lot going on. So pawn a4, he's just generating a small initiative on the queen side. And now Ding goes h6 gives his king a bit of room, and Raja goes h4. Might look a bit strange playing on that side of the board, but it's kind of a waiting move, seeing how black plays, and it's also the top computer approved move. So both players in their prep right now. And after h4, Ding brings a rook to the c file. Sometimes that's useful after the c file opens up, especially if white went for some mass liquidation on d5. And now the queen took on f5 here, the bishop recaptured, and Raja planted this knight on e4. So he's hitting this bishop. Ding wants to maintain his bishop pair. So he drops back to f8, but then this allows knight to c5. This wonderful outpost, looking at the a6 pawn, blocking this one in. How does Ding respond? Well, he comes up with an exceptional move here. He goes knight to b4 giving an entire piece and defending this pawn, but if white captures that piece, then black can take on d4 and has actually solved all problems. Because if the knight captures here, well, there's different ways for black to equalize, but you could even take here, give up your bishops, go in for something like this, no issues at all. So we didn't have that captures on b4. Raja left that knight there, he responded with another excellent move. He went rook to e5. So he hits that unprotected bishop. Now, if you drop back here, this is possible, but then you're running into h5. It's tricky stuff. White still has the pressure here, even though the material's level. So Ding goes for g6 instead, looking to maintain the bishop on that square. And now we had a captures on b5, pawn recaptures, and now can you see the best move for Radja in this position? And if you're enjoying this video, do hit that like button, let me know, and consider subscribing to the channel to never miss any of my candidates' coverage. So here, Radja played the exceptional move, knight e6. And this is just exploding the position on the light squares. Now, if we look at the obvious one here, pawn takes knight, well, the follow-up is rook takes on f5. Now, this pawn's pinned, of course, to the king, so you can't capture like that. So you'd have to take with the g pawn. Now you take here with check, and with this bishop slicing across the diagonal as well, the king would have to come here. You can pick up another with check before then taking the rook, and the sting at the end of the tail is that now you're taking on b4, the rook's not on the d file, and white's doing better here, two pawns up. So if we run back here to knight e6, that's why pawn didn't take. So the bishop took instead. This is the best move. Now the rook captured, again using this theme of after pawn captures, crashing through with the bishop with check, the king moved away, and then picking up on c8. So the rook recaptured, pawn takes on b4, so white is a pawn up now, and black has a really difficult defensive task actually, because say you take here for example, well then we can take on a6, and the problem is that this king is quite exposed, the rook could maybe start coming around behind the pawn now, it's just not so great for black, there's a lot of pressure for white. 
So what black actually wants to do here is trade the bishops if possible. That will make the defensive task easier. So rook c4 aims to do that. The rook moved away here and now bishop g7. This is why Ding goes for that one and doesn't take on b4. He wants to get the bishops off the board, hence why bishop e7 was played, ducking away from that, now protects this pawn. And again, we didn't have a captures on b2 because after rook a6, there's lots of pressure for white. So instead, rook c6 played, holds that a6 pawn. Now the rook came to a2, covers the b2 pawn. And here Ding should really look to improve this bishop with bishop to d4. It looks down at the king and it also covers this critical c5 square, stops the white bishop from anchoring there. But what Ding does in the game is king to g8. Now it looks really logical to start marching the king in, but now bishop c5 comes, blocks out that rook, anchored on that square, and now bishop f8 was really the last hope for Ding to again try and trade these bishops. White can still keep pressure, but that was the best move. But king f7 played, still marching in. But now king g2, king e6, pawn b3, opens up the rook laterally, and after pawn h5, king f3, king f5, the problem here is that when rook d2 comes, it's invading on d5, then the king is marching in, then the pawn is released, and this black rook is just completely tied up. So Ding tried bishop to e5, the rook invaded anyway, and after it was attacked by the king, king e4 simply protected it. And it's so hard to just unravel these black pieces now. So bishop f6 was played, pawn f4, and this prepares f5, undermining this pawn chain, then h5 will be weak. So bishop c3 played, pawn f5 check. Now the capture didn't happen, then the rook takes, you're immediately attacking this pawn. So the king gave ground, rook d7 check, and now the king steps back to g8, covering this h7 square, stopping the rook from swinging behind this pawn, and now an excellent finish from Raja. He doesn't want to just take here immediately, activate the black rook, looking at his own pawns, so he plays this interference move, bishop to d6, really classy technique. This forces the capture on f5 with check. Now the king marches in, but the problem is the h5 pawn, because after bishop g7, king g5, you can't save this pawn, then you'd have two connected passers, so here Ding resigned. So watch out for Raja, one misstep and he'll pounce. If you want to see my other candidate previews, click here. Thanks for watching, see you soon.